welcome uh, welcome to romed uh, panel on rethinking migration which I, I have the pleasure and the honor to co-chair with Anne Behrens, director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe. Uh, Anne and myself will alternate in asking our distinguished panelists, one commissioner, three minister, the director general of the International Migration Organization, asking them whether after the pandemic, we should get ready to reset, as the title suggests, and review migration partnership between the two shores of the Mediterranean. COVID has already had two profound effects on migration trends. On regular migration, our borders have certainly become more sealed. A new resident permit to foreigner in Europe will most likely drop from 3 million in 2019 to just 1 million in 2020, a 65% reduction which means that almost two million people that would have made it to Europe through regular channel this year to work, study, or join their family have not been able to do so. This reduction in regular migration channels to Europe, plus the deepest economic recession in a century, have had a deep effect on irregular migration across the Mediterranean. Irregular arrivals to Italy have almost tripled this year. Arrivals to Spain are up by 30% and are rising fast. Only arrival to Greece are back in the trend and possibly the only due to restrictive measure in Turkey rather than migrants intention to reach Europe. Against this backdrop, the overarching question for today are how has COVID impacted on cooperation on migration along the two shore of the Mediterranean? Should we reset partnership in order to relaunch them or should we proceed or how should we proceed in order to do that to answer this and other question i will now leave the floor to minister luciana lamorgese italy minister of the interior minister you have the floor good afternoon to everyone Thank you for having given me the floor and for speaking about the situation that we are experiencing in Italy with regard to migration flows. The pandemic has shown that there are no boundaries uh, amongst the states that can uh, uh, there are no barriers, and so the migration flows that uh, have increased have created further complications with regard to the acceptance of migrants. The figures the figures are quite high, 13,000. Uh, regular uh, migrants versus 3,600 last year. But also from Libya, we have had increases. Suffice it to consider that 19,000 arrived. Also uh, through the Balkans, there has been an increase And there has been increase in all the routes. So these increases have uh, worsened the situation and uh, uh, increased the burden for all sectors from health uh, to acceptance and so on. And there are additional difficulties due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So there is great complexity that has to be dealt with in managing the migration flows. And undoubtedly, also because of the economic crisis, the economic, social, and financial crises that are present in the northern African area, 
um, require that uh, something be done to provide acceptance to the migrations. However, the economic crisis in those countries has led to the fact that the flows are going to increase in coming months and years, and we will have to provide some sort of response over and above the uh, health crisis as well. So I think that uh, in this, um, from this standpoint, uh, in July we held a conference with uh, the presidents of the EU commissioner and uh, other uh, representatives of northern African countries like Tunisia, countries that are important for us. These are the countries where the migration flows originate. So we examined the uh, situation and the types of aid that Italy can give uh, to these countries. The presence of uh, Commissioner Johansson uh, is uh, greatly appreciated, and I thank her for the support that she has given. I think that in Europe, is, Europe can provide support to the countries of the Maghreb because these are the countries where many of the migration flows originate because of the living conditions in those countries. And so we need to do our best to try and eliminate, eradicate the causes that induce people to uh, leave their countries and provide support to these countries through partnerships and by seeking to uh, have an impact on the situations in those countries. Uh, And when once people uh, embark on that, the, the uh, journey to uh, reach uh, Europe, these are people that can't be stopped. It's difficult to uh, stop them. So what needs to be done is to take action and improve the conditions in their countries of origin and help them be able to live a dignified life in their own countries. So I think that Europe must make a commitment and it must provide responses in economic terms and, and take action. I have visited um, uh, Tunisia and other countries and speaking uh, with the current head of uh, the Tunisian government, we examined these various aspects. And for them as well, it is difficult. And uh, even um, we have noticed that human traffickers uh, have increased their activities. And uh, with Tunisia, it is important to uh, intervene on the places from which the uh, migrants uh, leave the country. Uh, it is a difficult situation. It's difficult to manage this situation in spite of the efforts made by the various countries. And also repatriation is um, actively pursued. So with Tunisia, we have uh, decided to speed up the procedures for repatriation. But, uh, we repatriate 80 people per week. And we realize that there are great difficulties, but I would like to say that uh, uh, what we're doing is uh, very little compared to uh, the needs.
we have had 1,500 people arriving per day, and so the situation is very difficult to handle. So we think that uh, what we are doing is undoubtedly insufficient and more needs to be done. And obviously, the situation has a political impact as well. We must bear in mind that uh, after the attack in uh, Nice, the attacker had arrived in Italy in Lampedusa. And uh, so in any case, it is a problem for security. It's a security problem that involves all the European countries. So at this point, I would like to that this is a very sensitive moment. And so it is most urgent for there to be a greater effort made by Europe because Spain and Italy are the countries of uh, uh, first approach by the uh, migrants, but uh, the issue is an issue that uh, affects the whole of Europe. We have stated what, are, what the critical issues are for Italy. And also relocation is a problem. Relocation by the various states is a problem, especially where the migrants are not in a position to apply for uh, asylum. They, can, they are not asylum seekers. We have a ministerial decree uh, in which we indicate uh, uh, what, which countries are considered to be safe countries for relocation. And obviously, each country has a given um, capacity for welcoming um, new migrants. And so the governments of the various countries need to uh, take this issue into account and provide uh, contribute to providing a solution. We went to Algeria. There's an agreement uh, that was entered into some time ago. But um, uh, with regard to Algerians, we um, repatriate no, not more than 10 per week. So even the repatriation uh, um, issue is a difficult one. And this also has an impact on the um, asylum pact. So I think that the issue must be looked at uh, from a general uh, standpoint in a comprehensive manner. And the commissioner knows what our position is. Uh, We have discussed with the issue with Spain and Cyprus and Greece. So there is a common position of these countries because we are the countries that uh, are reached first and foremost by the, um, the migrants. And the issue that There is also a security issue. And 
And we must uh, also realize that uh, uh, many of these migrants are migrants in, sea, in search of a better life, better economic conditions. So apart from those who are repatriated, <clears throat> we have tried to interact with other countries to work out some joint solution and So most of the migrants actually um, use Italy as a stepping stone because their aim is to reach the northern European countries. So there is a structural problem uh, and the situation is worsened by the COVID uh, pandemic. Migrations are a fact, they have always existed and so we need to work out some sort of solution. We need to regulate these flows and cooperate with the other European countries. There needs to be solidarity, accountability, responsibility and a common solution needs to be found to the problem. Thank you, Minister Lamorgese. Thank you for the extremely blunt assessment of the many challenges. I'm sure that uh, uh, Anne Behrens uh, will uh, get uh, with her speaker or panelists into some of these topics. Anne, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael and Welcome also to all of you and thank you for inviting me to help moderate the panel with you. It's an honor. Um, I would like to first um, reach out to uh, Commissioner Ilva Johansen. Good afternoon to you. Um, we've just uh, uh, been listening to the minister and um, this panel has the ambition to reimagine migration partnerships and this ties very nicely with the launch of the EU Pact on Migration and Asylum uh, last September where um, it is made clear that the EU wants to step up uh, on its um, partnerships with third countries in this particular area, really from a deep conviction that migration policies work particularly well um, if they're an interest of partner countries of the EU and migrants and refugees. But we know also very well that in the run-up and the writing of the pact, considerable attention was paid to um, the tone that we strike when we're in dialogue um, with those countries, how that dialogue will be pursued, but also the focus of that dialogue, not only focusing on return and readmission, but also expanding access to legal pathways. So, uh, Commissioner Johansen, uh, what are we looking for in terms of the change that we will see in the upcoming period? Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity. And I think that we actually have a lot of good opportunities ahead of us, but uh, we have to work close together and cooperate to be able to manage migration. Migration is something normal. Uh, migration has always been there, will always be there. And in the European Union, we need migration, but we also need to manage migration better. And that's part also of uh, the, the aim with the pact that I, I presented uh, two months ago. But I think also we need to say something about the, the current situation with, with COVID. Uh, this is one of the most, uh, the biggest challenges that we have to manage uh, right now. And, uh, and especially the economic crisis that it is causing because it has direct uh, effect on, on migration as well. People lose their jobs. And economic uncertainty will bring political instability, unfortunately. So many people, uh, we can see that now, many people uh, in need see smugglers uh, as a, a solution, as an opportunity to get um, uh, into those dangerous boats uh, and go on these very, very dangerous uh, journeys through the Mediterranean. Uh, and we have seen huge increase of departures from Tunisia to Italy, but also huge increase um, uh, increase on 10 times uh, to the Canary Islands. And that's the most deadly route, actually. That's also the, outside the Mediterranean, but it's the same kind of, of, uh, of problems as well. 
So <clears throat> the, we are really facing big, big challenges. And we uh, presented, presented also huge uh, support from the European Union to deal with uh, the COVID situation and the economic crisis that it uh, causes. We have uh, mobilized as Team Euro, uh, Europe 2.3 billion euros for the southern neighborhood countries. But coming also now, as you mentioned, to my new pact, uh, uh, it's it's an, a fresh start on migration, I hope. And a key part, as you also mentioned, uh, is the stronger cooperation with our friends, neighbors and partners. I want to establish comprehensive, balanced and tailor-made partnerships on migration to fight smugglers and establish legal pathways to, for my, to migration to boost capacity for border management on land and at sea, to create economic opportunities and address the root causes of irregular migration, to work together on returns and readmission, and to protect vulnerable migrants and host communities. To be able to do this, uh, we have helped by the Commission's proposal that 10% of the new neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument, the funds, will be used to support migration and migration management and governance. We must improve opportunities in our partner countries. Together with our partners, uh, we, I want to work on job creation and investments inclusive education, training and social policies to improve opportunities for all, but maybe especially for young people. Second, we will expand possibilities for regular migration, and this links to reducing irregular migration to the European Union. The Commission will soon launch a talent partnership to step up and support labour migration, training and mobility with key third countries. The renewed EU visa code will also encourage short-term mobility for students, for example. Resettlement is essential to offer safe and legal pathways to people in need of protection. Through resettlement, the European Union had already offered tens of thousands of refugees a new home, and I'm proud of that. But we need to increase our efforts when it comes to resettlement of refugees. We have also worked with resettlement uh, from Libya. 5,700 vulnerable refugees and asylum seekers have been transferred from Libya with the help of UNHCR since uh, November uh, three years ago. Third, we want to work with our partners to step up on returns, readmission and reintegration. The new pact stresses very much the need to make returns work. EU member states need to exchange much more on best practices and, of course, return is part of our dialogue with partner, uh, partners on migration when needed. So let me be clear, everyone has the fundamental right to apply for asylum. But currently, more than two-thirds of irregular uh, arrivals are not refugees and their asylum application will be rejected. I think then it's better to return people swiftly and humanely to their country of origin and help them to reintegrate there. And here it's also in of the essence with swift processes so that people would have the decision quick. That's why we have to work for making returns for those that do not have the right to stay in the European Union quick and effective. Only by reducing irregular migration to the European Union, we will be able to increase legal pathways for labor migration and resettlement and send a strong signal to smugglers as well that their business model needs to be disrupted. I also want to say something on voluntary returns. Voluntary return programs work. Supported by the European Union, 50,000 migrants benefited from a voluntary return and reintegration program from Libya to countries of origin. This is a very good example of cooperation between the European Union, the United Nations and the African Union and Libya. And this is a model that we should build on further, even more. Next year, I will present our strategy on voluntary return and reintegration from the EU to countries of origin and from third countries to countries of origin. Fourth, we need to tackle irregular migration together. That means preventing irregular departures, fighting smugglers, 
destroy their business model. This our, and it's also our moral duty to save lives at sea. To kick, up, uh, to kick off this uh, cooperation, we organized the ministerial conference against migrant smuggling this summer, as also mentioned by Luciana Lamorgese, who hosted it. Um, and there we also had the key uh, EU member states, and five of our key African partners were there, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Mauritania, and from Libya we had Minister Bashaga, who is also here with us today. The European Union uh, will do everything we can to disrupt smuggling networks and their activities. We are ready to fully support joint efforts in border management, which we were, it's very important for our North African partners, joint investigations teams to fight criminal networks, awareness rising campaigns on the deadly risks of irregular migration. And we will make full use of our network of EU liaison uh, migration officers deployed in key partner countries. And last but certainly not least, we will work together to support vulnerable migrants and host communities on the spot. Like, for example, our support programs in Libya, where we support, work to support migrants and vulnerable people in cooperation with IOM and UNHCR. We also support local communities hosting migrants. We support uh, the same in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Sudan, who, who host large numbers of refugees. Everything I have just discussed, I am right now putting into action. It's my personal mission to build close, strong and effective partnerships with our friends and neighbours. I've already visited Tunisia together with uh, my colleague Commissioner Vaheli and together with Italian Minister Luci Luciana Lamorgese and also Minister Di Maio. I've already visited Mauritania and the Canary Islands with Minister Grande Malasca from Spain. I will visit Morocco next week. Morocco is a key partner for the EU, including on migration, and we have a long-standing relationship to build on. With the new pact on migration, we have the tools to build lasting partnerships to manage migration. So I look forward to working together towards this goal of jointly managing migration uh, in partnership which is so important to, for Europe, but also for our partner countries. And let's not forget the importance for the men, women and children out there in need of protection or hoping to build a better life. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johansson. Thank you for outlining uh, the different components uh, of the pact and how you're envisaging those uh, cooperation uh, with third countries to improve and giving some very concrete uh, examples. Uh, we will now uh, turn to uh, Minister Mr. Fatih Bashaga. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Fatih Bashaga, to you. Um, you are the, the Minister of Interior of the, um, the government of, of Libya. And what we would like to maybe discuss with you uh, is already uh, the Minister of, of, of Interior of Italy and also Commissioner Johansson also referred to this already um, with um, the pandemic, um, there's, of course, a great concern about the impact on countries, on their economies, on um, um, uh, COVID-induced migration due to the loss of jobs, of, of livelihoods, opportunities, but also maybe conflict over scarce resources. And um, we know, of course, that uh, Libya has worked together uh, closely with the EU over the past years to, to reduce um, irregular migration uh, to the continent. But of course, we also just heard that over the summer, um, there has been a rise in uh, irregular migration from, from Libya. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from you how you assess the situation for the moment, but also what you're looking forward to in the cooperation with the EU, um, what kind of common interests uh, you want to pursue with them, and what is the support that your country needs also in that respect. Thank you. First of all, I wish to express my pleasure for being uh, here and uh, speaking about uh, the importance of uh, our partnership uh, in a post-COVID-19 uh, era. Uh, COVID-19 has added to us, to our um, to the challenges that we face in uh, Africa, new challenges. Although COVID has not hit uh, Africa as much as it has hit uh, other uh, 
continents. According to statistics, there are two million uh, cases of COVID in Africa. And uh, this is due to the fact that most inhabitants in Africa uh, are uh, less than uh, uh, 35. And also, uh, COVID tests are not very widespread. Despite all this, migration in, uh, is uh, still on the go. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN uh, last year has uh, called uh, for a ceasefire in order uh, all over the world in order to face uh, the COVID challenge. challenge. However, this has not stopped uh, the numbers of the internally displaced going up to 14 million. Uh, and uh, currently, they have uh, increased uh, to more than 80 million. Uh, ever since uh, uh, the uh, pandemic has started in uh, February, many measures have uh, been adopted by many countries, by all countries, uh, and also in Africa. The situation has become uh, the humanitarian situation in many countries, including Libya, has deteriorated. Uh, Libya hosts more than uh, 50,000 um, uh, refugee and migrant. Uh, many Africans uh, who uh, work here have uh, suffered uh, from uh, this uh, pandemic. The, this, uh, the current difficult situation at the economic level in Africa uh, has uh, been added to the uh, current uh, conflicts, uh, whether in Burkina uh, Faso or uh, um, uh, Ethiopia, as well as the uh, natural disasters uh, due to cr climate change. Uh, all uh, this uh, worsens uh, the economic situation. We also uh, face a, a decrease in external exportations as well as trade, which uh, has, which is expected to worsen next year, all at a time when the demography is on the increase. At the same time, we also face an increase in unoccupied unemployment. Despite all this, we can, and because of all this, we can see that the minimum level of uh, the Millennium Development Goals has not been achieved. The number of the immigrants uh, who reach uh, the southern coast of Italy gives us an idea. Despite uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, Italy has received higher numbers compared to 2019. In the spring of 2021, when the pandemic has been limited, conflicts continued. If in two, although if in 2021 the pandemic is contained, if the conflicts go on, we will not be able to face all these challenges. Uh, also due to the limited resources that we have. The uh, current measures uh, uh, will not be enough in order to prevent migrants from crossing the Mediterranean unless Libya is helped in controlling its borders. It is essential to it is essential to work on improving cooperation at these levels. Last September, uh, we amended uh, our uh, laws 
on migration, but uh, the, this was extremely uh, limited because it did not touch on uh, transit countries. Uh, and uh, the European countries uh, had to host uh, huge numbers of uh, migrants. The poorer uh, African countries who, that have been most affected by COVID-19 need, uh, for instance, uh, help uh, such as uh, rescheduling uh, their debt and uh, uh, the financing of uh, financial deficits and uh, a response uh, f in order to guarantee food security and uh, uh, reach zero hunger, as well as other measures. The solutions must not only uh, be of a security nature. They also have to be of an economic uh, nature by also giving Libya a special uh, trade status, allowing for job opportunities. The uh, coronavirus pandemic has represented an, a real challenge in the face of migration policies and has put in doubt uh, their efficiency. Uh, this is why cooperation in the field of migration has uh, to be built on a real revision of all sectors, including the health se sector. Uh, so as to be able to face pandemics. Uh, and this is an important opportunity uh, for all international institutions that can help uh, Libya in uh, reaching peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Thank you very much for enriching our conversation, also by outlining very vividly the impact that the COVID pandemic has had in your country, but also in neighboring countries in terms of affecting the economy, um, the unemployment rate, um, and how this all of these elements uh, feed into the potential migration pressure uh, from your country, but also from neighboring countries. And I, I, my understanding is that uh, Mr. Vitorino will also uh, uh, build on that and also for outlining some of the support that you deem very important in terms of helping with border control, security, but also, as you say, issues of trade and health infrastructure. I now uh, hand over the floor to Mr. Magri. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Antonio Vitorino, Director General of the IOM, was uh, with us in Rome last year as well and uh, share with us uh, last year is view on the general trends on migration and on the global compact. It looks like a century ago, Mr. Vittorino, in view of what has happened in the last uh, 10 months. Can you share us your view on future trends on migration, uh, given what has happened? So much, it's a pleasure to be back uh, to the mad dialogues. <laughs> Uh, virtually this year, hopefully next year it will be in person. I will just say that uh, the COVID-19 has uh, created a number of uh, border closures and travel, travel restrictions, and this has created uh, millions of migrants that are stranded, uh, trying to reach back home to their countries of origin, but unable to do so, both in the Middle East, in North Africa or in the Horn of Africa. And I'll be very frank, we do not know what will happen with them if they are not able to return back to their countries of origin. But most likely, they might start moving and having recourse to irregular pathways, especially being vulnerable to traffickers and smugglers. So addressing the challenge of stranded migrants is a short-term priority. I will give you some examples. 
Fortunately, we have been able for some weeks now to restart our voluntary humanitarian return flights from Libya. But the effectiveness of our return flights from Libya depends to a large extent on our operation in Niger because only our operation in Niger will allow people to return back to the countries of origin and being reintegrated. And here I take the opportunity to see on the screen Commissioner uh, Johansson to recall her that uh, the current EU Trust Fund that sustains our operations in Niger is coming to an end. And this is an alarm bell, I ring the bell. Because if uh, there is no solution to guarantee the continuity of the Niger operation, uh, the returns from Libya will be much more limited. So there is a need to guarantee a bridging between the point we are now and the point we want to be when the Asylum and Migration Pact will come into force. My second remark is uh, about the situation of uh, uh, the Western Balkans. It's true that the Eastern Mediterranean route has been uh, in the drop, but the situation in the Western Balkans is a source of concern, especially in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We might have 4,000 or 5,000 migrants without shelter in Bosnia-Herzegovina during the winter. And of course, if they are not properly accommodated, they will go on moving. In terms of global figures, it's a source of concern, the rise of arrivals in Italy. And that is also something that has already been mentioned by Minister Lamborghese and by the Commissioner Johansson. The, the numbers of Tunisians arriving in Italy are on the rise. So there is a need to build a short-term solution with Tunisia of cooperation and uh, support to the Tunisian border guard and to the Tunisian government to guarantee that we reduce the pressure from Tunisia. Last but not least, 10 times more arrivals to Canary Islands. And Commissioner Johansson has just mentioned that it's, it is really the deadliest route because the Atlantic is not the Mediterranean. The Atlantic is really, really tough. And the people who arrive to the Canary Islands, 50% of them come from Morocco. And I'm very glad that Commissioner Johansson goes to Morocco next week. It's absolutely vital to stop the flow from Morocco, but also from Senegal. And Senegal it will be, in my view, a key country to focus on to smooth the pressure on the Canary Islands. I will conclude by saying that international partnerships are fundamental. We very much praise the work that we do jointly with UNHCR as the United Nations string of the tripartite cooperation with the European Union and the African Union in Libya. I believe that it is necessary to expand this tripartite approach. And from the African side, we have very clear signs that they will be willing to engage in a tripartite cooperation in relation to the Sahel. And let's be very frank, the Sahel is going to be the next big crisis. So we encourage very much the European institutions and the European member states to engage with the African Union and with the United Nations in dealing with the Sahel. Thank you so much, Paolo. Thank you, Director General. Uh, let me now move to Minister Bartolo. Uh, Minister Bartolo, we mentioned several times in this uh, conversation irregular migrants. Uh, over the last three years, uh, your country has been the destination for over 7,000 irregular migrants, which is close to 1.5% of the total population. How is your country trying to manage irregular migration? and to cope with it. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk. Coming at the end of the other speakers, it's very nice for me to say, I was going to say everything they said, but, uh, but there are some things which I need to say because they are specific.
to the smallest uh, to the smallest member in the European Union, uh, not only in terms of size, but then also uh, densely populated, which makes us more vulnerable. We know that no country, however big it is, can solve the irregular migrant problem on its own. More so for a small country like Malta, because for us, the most realistic and preferred way of managing is to reduce the numbers of regular regular migrants that come to Malta, because whatever numbers we're talking about is a big problem for us. We don't have the carrying capacity to receive all those who want to, or or all those who end up who end up in Malta. Please keep in mind, and I'm not trying to play with statistics, that 1,000 arriving in Malta means. 1 million arriving in the European Union. And you remember that when we had the migrant crisis, we said that a million was a crisis. For us, every thousand that arrives means it's like having a million arriving in the European Union. This year, we've had uh, 2,300. Thanks, thanks to our cooperation with Libya, they have intercepted and taken back at least 9,000 9, that would have come to Malta. In our case, that means over 11,000 would have arrived in Malta. That is, is, is for us, it's, it would have been a crisis because we don't have the carrying capacity. And apart from that, having so, so many arriving in Malta, uh, with also with what Commissioner Johansson has explained, the anxiety and the, uh, I mean, Please keep in mind that our economy is based totally on tourism. 30% of our, of our economy is based on tourism. So people feel very anxious, even if it's irrational. People feel very anxious. People feel very, very worried that their livelihood is at risk. So this complicates, complicates matters. So in our case, the most realistic and preferred option is, in our case, to cooperate with Libya, and as much as possible, prevent boats from leaving, intercept them and take them back. Now, I know that this is an issue because as Libya is not considered a safe country, it is an issue. And this is a very big, a very big uh, problem for us, but we have only managed to stem irregular migration, either when we had help, tangible help from Libya, from Libya or tangible help also from Italy. So honestly, in our case, we cannot have two extremes. Two extremes is the inhuman option of let them drown. And it is terrible to have surveys carried out in Malta saying that 45% of people, we have not published these statistics, 45% of people are ready to say, let them drown. I mean, it is terrible. It is terrible. The other extreme is let them all come, which is also not, not possible or, or acceptable for us. So we have to do something between the two extremes. Uh, I will just mention some points that have, not been, that have not been mentioned, I think, also because I'm seeing them obviously from the prism of a small, of a small, of a small country. Um, number one. We are, and, and the European Union uh, has, again now, hel is helping Libya and the Libyan coast guards to manage to manage the 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 coast, the coastal the coastal border. As Minister Bashaga has said, we need to help them manage also the land border with the with the Sahel. We also need to take more active measures to fight the traffickers and the smugglers and start putting them on uh, sanctions, more, more on sanctions list, because that would help also the Libyan authorities to build their own institutions, because uh, we, we would be helping them tangibly. Also to take them to, to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, we, we can help even like that, we can, we can, help, we can help Libya. But then there is something which I know is an issue also for, for our Libyan friends, which is not having uh, reception centers for migrants. This is becoming an issue. I know that over the last uh, weeks, we have had issues where the Libyan Coast Guard comes out 
takes migrants back, and then they don't have facilities where to put them. Libya has been put under a lot of pressure to close down uh, migrant migrant centers, which obviously had a very bad reputation in terms of the conditions under which migrants have been kept. And I would be the first one to say they must be kept in, in humane conditions where their rights are protected and where they are safeguarded. But now the the it seems that the alternative to closing down those detention centers have been no centers at all and people are being turned out in the streets. Also, we have been told that uh, sometimes the Coast Guards are told, don't come, don't go out for them because we don't have where to keep them. And if I am well informed, on one occasion, Libyan Coast Guards were actually, they had, had their salary reduced because they still went out to get the migrants, the migrants back. So we need to, to do something about migrant centers in Libya. I know that the, the, our Libyan friends have an issue with that. Uh, we, we must discuss this because otherwise it is going to turn into an issue. I know that Libya itself is a transit country. And, and uh, if 5,700 have been uh, returned or taken to, to the African centers that we have in Rwanda and Niger, uh, let's keep in mind that's only 10% of asylum seekers and refugees uh, in Libya. So we have to do something about that. Uh, the issue of Libya being a safe country, we all need to work hard and harder to have peace and prosperity uh, in Libya, to be, to be able to make Libya a land of opportunity again, like it has been for millions of, of, of migrant workers from, uh, from everywhere. Uh, another issue which I need to point out, which is going to be, which is going to be a problem for us, uh, is the drone surveillance that is being planned for next year uh, by Frontex. To have a drone system from one end of the Mediterranean to another, to uh, inform the southern European coastal states that the boats are coming. If the drone surveillance system is going to work only in that way, that is going to be a big problem for us uh, as, a, as a small country because that plays in the hands of the traffickers and the smugglers because they will ha have their mind at rest that there are drones that are tracking the boats and they will turn will tell their their clients i'm using this word ironically they will tell the they will tell the migrant the migrants don't worry the drones are going to track you and somehow or other you will be you will be saved so don't worry that is going to be a pull factor drains uh, drone surveillance will help if it is also coordinated with the sending countries with the north african countries not just with the receiving uh, southern european countries and then one issue which i think and again me commissioner johansen uh, rightly mentioned uh, and i think we need to be very 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 strong on this um, yes, regular migration. Let's make it. Let's make it available, uh, safe migration. Malta would definitely be in favour of that. We are a, a, a small country of migrants. You know, however small we are, we are in about 194 countries around the world, and uh, we we have been safe because we have been able to be migrants elsewhere: Canada, US, Britain. Uh, and, and the Mediterranean littoral, littoral uh, countries as well. But we must be tougher on those countries that do not cooperate with us about taking back irregular migrants. And what France is considering doing, uh, like, for example, not granting uh, visas to political leaders and business people from those countries that do not cooperate with us to take back their nationals, which are regular migrants, I think is a good is a good thing to consider, uh, so that so that we uh, clamp down on irregular migrants. When I talk to the UNHCR people, they tell me as well that what is happening with irregular the migrants, they are clogging and blocking the avenues of asylum seekers, who are usually much more vulnerable than the irregular migrants, because the irregular migrants somehow or other have the, the resources to move, uh, even though they are in a difficult situation. But with asylum speakers, uh, sorry, seekers, 
they are obviously more more vulnerable. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Minister, but we yeah. only have a few minutes, and I promised that we would have a shorter uh, second round. Uh, I will start with a quick question to uh, Minister Lamorgese, Commissioner Johnson, and Director General Vitorino. The same question. So the topic of our panel is relaunching partnership with the Southern Shore. And you all mentioned uh, uh, in your intervention the need to go ahead with partnership. But what can we offer which is mutually beneficial? Uh, the Northern Shore will have less resources given to the pandemic. The Southern Shore will need more resources given to the pandemic. So what can be uh, on the table for our uh, relo nego re relaunched negotiation? Uh, Minister Lamorgese. I listened with great interest to what was said. And I agree on most things that were said, except for, for instance, when we're speaking about uh, returning the uh, migrants, uh, with regard to uh, swift procedures, there isn't an agreement yet with the third countries that enable for such returns to uh, take place quickly. So the, the problem right now is um, the fact that we don't have agreements with these third countries. With regard to the specific question, I think that it is necessary in this context to uh, look at the root causes of migration and to uh, pr help these countries to uh, grow, to relaunch their economies. And uh, an example could be the uh, um, development of alternative economies capable of uh, providing prospects uh, for livelihood, uh, so that people can have a livelihood. Now, when we speak about partnerships, I would like to say that undoubtedly we need to uh, contribute and to setting right the, def the economic deficit of these countries and encourage encourage the interventions on infrastructure and enable the companies to go to these countries and help um, uh, with production, help with development, so that con therefore provide contributions to these countries also in the form of um, uh, assistance, technical assistance. Uh, with regard to the infrastructure, uh, we need to provide uh, help there as well. Therefore, we need to uh, provide assistance in uh, with regard to health care, the infrastructure for health care, provide equipment and uh, systems that uh, that we have in Europe. So when migrants arrive, we have many migrants who uh, left their countries without uh, any health, uh, ex health examinations. Uh, and because obviously they, they don't have these facilities. And we have equipped ourselves to be able to uh, provide health uh, care. And then we must also promote initiatives for cooperation. And also enable our industries, our uh, uh, companies to uh, go to these countries and set up partnerships with local uh, uh, companies there.
Commissioner Johansson, will we have enough, will you have enough political backing in enlarging our effort on this topic, uh, given, for example, the survey that Minister Bartolo mentioned, 45 percent believing that it would be better if people uh, die in the sea uh, instead of creating a problem? Letting people die in the sea is not uh, an opportunity at all. We have an obligation to save lives at sea. And to answer your question, there is a huge support from all member states that we should engage even more on the external dimension on migration. So I have full support uh, on that side. And of course, to, to your first question, it's every uh, partnership need to be tailor-made for that specific partner, of course. Uh, it's not one size fits all. So it, that, uh, to, to be mutually beneficial, it had to be tailor-made for the specific partnership. But things that could be part of that partnership is, of course, of course creating a, a economic opportunities. And a uh, minister, uh, Bashaga also mentioned the job creation, uh, the importance of also investing in structure, uh, food safety. Uh, there could be uh, other uh, issues, of course, trade uh, that is uh, part of investment in strategic reforms that is part of addressing root causes. Uh, for um, of irregular migration. But then we also need to work together to fight smugglers. And that could be police cooperation, that could be helping building capacity on border management, both at land and sea, for example. Uh, but also, I should say, uh, capacity to, to manage migration. And that could also be part of that. And establishing legal pathways. So it's, uh, it should be uh, obvious that uh, for young people, not only young, but mostly young, uh, that is our also other opportunities to come legally to uh, start a new future or, or on circular mi migration as well in, in the European Union. And then we also could work together on uh, returns and readmission, which is very important for the EU part, that should be mutually beneficial, and to protect uh, the vulnerable migra migrants and to help hosting countries. I think this is also a very important part of our partnerships. And what I mentioned, voluntary returns is an area, uh, I think, both from EU to our countries of origin and to helping other partner countries with voluntary returns from their country to countries of origin is also part of some examples that could be part of that kind of mutually beneficial uh, partnerships. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Director General Vittorino was listening to you and understood from your words that the refunding of the Niger operation is possible. <laughs> but now I, I give him the floor. How can we build partnership uh, in this, uh, rebuild partnership in this situation? Two minutes only, I'm afraid. Even less, I would say that I can subscribe everything that Minister Lamborghese and uh, Commissioner Johansson have just said. From my side, I would only have one point. In my view, if we want to be credible in uh, fostering the return, voluntary return policy, we need to couple it with a very focused approach to reintegration in the countries of origin. That's the best way of overcoming the political difficulties of readmission, which is always a thorny issue. If you present it as a package of return and reintegration, where the reintegration side is to the benefit of the communities from where migrants come and where there are strong drivers for migration, I believe that uh, uh, the countries of origin will see in that an advantage, and that will represent also a leverage to the host countries, to the countries of destination. So from our side, I will put the emphasis on the indissociable link between return and reintegration. To the Director General, very quickly, but, uh, and what about the link between regular channel and return? Is this uh, working in terms of a mutually beneficial package? Yes, definitely. I agree with that in spite of the fact that it does not work automatically. Uh, I mean, once again, 
things need to be seen uh, tailor made tailor made uh, you cannot expect that opening up legal channels you have an automatic uh, impact in reducing irregular that does not work like that but definitely putting on the table regular migration legal channels is an element of the negotiation definitely thank you and uh, i left two ministers for you i'm sorry to keep them waiting you please Thank you. Sorry I, uh, for the mic. Um, yes, um, I just wanted to ask to uh, Mr. Um, Bashaga as well, Minister Bashaga. We've listened to some of the, the proposals that are being made of both by Commissioner Johansson in terms of how to cooperate uh, with those countries. Um, how does that resonate with um, your, your uh, plans in terms of also um, building up a capacity on the ground in terms of what we heard earlier also from Mr. Bartolo, the need to better uh, manage borders, but also make sure that there's opportunities within the country uh, for the local population. Thank you. Libya currently is undergoing uh, uh, a deep crisis and a division in the state. Uh, however, with very few means, we have managed to contribute greatly in limiting illegal migration. We have certain requests uh, we wish to address uh, through Italy to the European uh, Union. Uh, if we can be able to uh, have uh, uh, monitoring, uh, electronic monitoring uh, tools, as well as uh, the possibility uh, to be able to, co this will give us the possibility to control uh, migration. Uh, however, uh, the EU must also take into consideration uh, the possibility of uh, logistic support to Libya as well as uh, the capacity uh, to host these uh, migrants. Uh, Libya needs to uh, develop its uh, capacities. You are all well aware that uh, the capacities that we have in Libya in centers is very limited. Uh, in the past period, we have uh, closed all uh, centers that host uh, migrants uh, especially because of the problems we had in the period uh, of 2013 and after that. We are actually capable of limiting illegal uh, migration, but we need uh, more help. We also wish to uh, request a partnership with the EU in securing our borders. Uh, if it's possible to start maybe uh, with a certain area. This on the one hand, but on the other, we also need uh, a process of development, maybe Europe through its experience, and uh, considering that Libya is part of Africa and we have past experience uh, since Libya has invested uh, um, a lot in the past in Europe. Uh, such investment needs uh, to be developed. We can uh, be vital contributors in any plan that will actually lead to creating new job opportunities in Europe uh, for the Africans. And this, of course, will be to the benefit of all our peoples. Thank you, Minister. Let's turn to Minister uh, Bartolo now. Uh, Minister Bartolo, I think you very uh, vividly described uh, what the implications are in terms of the number of arrivals and if we then translate that to the per capita pressure that this puts on your country and your country's asylum and migration systems, these are quite considerable. So on the one hand in this panel, we, we talked about what can be done indeed in terms of the migratory flows to your country, but of course another element that you uh, alluded to is this kind of solidarity across the EU. And so in, 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 in September, uh, Malta also signed together with a number of willing member states uh, um, an agreement in terms of uh, cooperation and support when it comes to 
those uh, who are rescued from sea uh, through search and rescue uh, missions. So we wanted to also ask you in that respect, uh, we saw that uh, due to the COVID pandemic, of course, uh, relocations actually almost stalled. Uh, what, are, what are the prospects in terms of, of that re-stepping up in the coming period? And what are your concerns about that? And how can you see this uh, going forward to make sure that also in that respect, support is given to your country? Thank you. Well, we hope that the future will be better than the past, because in the last 15 years, we've had only 8% of our arrivals being relocated to other EU partner states. Only 8%. Now, with the COVID, it might actually be even more difficult because we understand that there are jobs being lost, both in the sending countries, in the transit countries, and in the receiving countries. So we understand. And also, unfortunately, the electoral mood. And there are a number of elections coming up in the next two, three years. Uh, the electoral mood of coalition governments, uh, where parties compete in an anti-migrant uh, rhetoric, it's going to make it more difficult. So we still fortunately have had in the last few months, uh, countries like Germany and France helping us. Uh, but for us, relocation is important, but we don't see it as being the main, the main uh, solution. Uh, I go along with what our colleagues have said that uh, migration is is a is a symptom of other problems like unemployment, poverty, abuse of human rights, corruption, uh, persecution, wars. Uh, we need to tackle those as well. Otherwise, we'll be just putting our finger in the dike, and that is not enough. Thank you. Thank you, dear uh, panelists. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, uh, Director General Vitorino. Uh, I hope we have been a little bit late with our schedule. I'm sorry with you. I'm sorry with those who are attending. But I think the topic uh, and the issue you raised were worth the 10 minute extra time we had. Thank you very much. And thank to Anne for co-chairing this meeting.